You're listening to The Dental Guys. What's the difference between a tax preparer and a tax strategist? Chris Mayhunt, oh, do it again. Take three. You're listening to The Dental Guys. What's the difference between a tax preparer and a tax strategist? Chris Mahan joins us to discuss that and all the answers to some of the most important questions you have about tax planning, both for 2021 and beyond, this week on The Dental Guys. When the dental guys need an infection prevention product, we turn to Kerr and their Total Care line. Kerr has been an industry leader in infection control and prevention products for years, and when we think of infection control, cavicide and cavi wipes are the first things that come to our minds. It's automatic, and there's a reason for that. Kerr knows dentistry, and their products work. The dental guys trust Kerr products in our offices, and you should too. Stay safe with Kerr Total Care. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. And hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And I'll tell you, uh, this is, I think, going to be a timely episode for all of you out there who are thinking about what's coming for the end of the year, beginning of next year. Because, you know, last year or two, to say that our political situation has been crazy would be an understatement. Regardless of which side you're on, it's been crazy. And so everybody's been kind of wondering, when is something going to hit the fan here as far as you know, taxes and um, planning for how our businesses are going to grow and are the businesses going to grow. So we're going to have some good discussion about that. And, you know, in the business growth cycle, there comes a time, and it's funny because both of us are kind of in this time and our practices in different ways where it's time to change things. It's time to, you know, reinvent things or move to the next kind of part of, of practice life. And Wes, you've been doing some stuff in the last year, maybe two, especially in the last six months that has been pretty crazy. We talked a little bit about it on the show. So where are you at with the building? Yeah, we haven't really given an update, um, you know, John, for a little bit. And I feel like that we kind of had to take a break from maybe that update. And, um, you know, the dental guys, <laughs> the dental guys, you know, we have a passion for podcasting for sure, because, and I, I would say like, if you've noticed <laughs> that our show release schedule hasn't been as consistent here in the past, probably three or four months. And you know what? You got to shore up home base. <laughs> you got to yeah. shore up, you got to shore Always. up the, the work the mother life, shit, man. Yeah, that's right. You've got to You've got to shore up like the work life balance. You know what I mean? Yep. I mean, yep. It really we all is. know what that means. Right. So let me let me just give you a little update of where we're at with, one, the dental guys. Like, we are solid, right? John and I are solid. Some of you are, like, checking in on us, like, wondering what's up. Um, yeah, we're solid. Okay, so oh, yeah. the, the dental guys. We got guys, some really cool stuff coming up in first quarter. Because finally, finally, in-person meetings are back. You yeah. know, and, and we're going to be at some amazing, uh, you know, in-person meetings doing some coverage and some presentations and stuff like that. So we're finally feeling like in some ways, continuing education drives what we do, you know, it, it and, does, and whether it's, whether it's us doing it or us seeing it or being involved with it. So yeah, we're excited about what uh, next year's oh, man. bringing. Yeah. Next year's bringing some hot stuff. We're excited about it. We're in the preparation and planning for that kind of stuff right now. So we, we just got back from even doing our own training, right? At art restorative driven implants, big, uh, three day weekend. John, you got, 
Like John's on the way to the airport and like Delta's like, no, because of operational errors, we can't connect this to that A to B. Like, man, like John, you got shafted by the airlines. We had to like fill in for you during the surgical phase of restorative implants. It was so frustrating. So frustrating. I mean, I I was, I've been through lots of travel situations, but you know, this, if you all are traveling right now or trying, just be aware (laughs) that it may not happen. You know, that was the second time in two weeks that I had a flight completely canceled where I had to travel to a new, another city to try to get the flight. This time I couldn't make it. There was no John, way to get John, there coming from back, here. Coming back from uh, restorative driven implants. Um, well, what normally takes four hours maybe in flights and connections, you know, and, and it's funny because my wife and I made the same flight like a month before this and we left at seven. We're home by 1130. And this time I had to leave the cabin at three 30 in the morning. I didn't get home because really? of operational delays until three 30 in the afternoon. It took, I 12, mean, what are you flying to India? I mean, you know, I mean, John, we made that flight. Travel day. We've made, we've made that flight. I know I've been on that flight 12 hour <laughs> oh, travel day to get goodness. to like from North to the South of the United States of America. Listen, yeah, in the so next, anyway, in the, in the next in the next show, we're going to give a little update, right, on what's going on with the building project, right? I'm building a dental office, right? I'm moving and doubling the square footage. I'm going from five operatories and I'm an associate with three hygienists to nine operatories with three, you know, all the stuff, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that here coming up on the next episode. So stay tuned for that. But today, right, it's end of the year. And like, you're all wondering, like, how do the dental guys prepare for the end of year thinking of what April 15th will bring? Or are we just going to wait till April 15th like I've done in the past? Until I met our guest and somebody that has know-how, right, on how to strategize and plan. You see, it's about planning and it's about really preemptively striking, right, on your tax bill before you even get your bill. And so that's what we're going to talk about today um, on The Dental Guys is some of these preparation things you can begin to do now. Right. Like, John, can you order something right now for a tax write off and expect to get it before right. the We're end of the year? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk yeah. about that, you know, because these some of the strategies that we would use in the past, we might not be able to use now. And some new strategies are coming down the line as a result of changes in the government, as a result of changes in the laws. And just, you know, as we've gotten more guidance on some of these things. So we're going to be bringing right after our break, we're bringing on Chris Mahan to talk about tax planning and end of year strategizing for the dental practice. So stay tuned after this message from our sponsor for a great episode about some very timely planning that you need to be thinking about before the end of this year. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbrand with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. Do you have a written business plan encompassing all areas of your potential practice? What's your marketing strategy? How much will it cost you to open each year? What is your growth plan? How many patients you need to see daily in order to break even? What is your most profitable service? These are just a few questions that your banker will not answer when you're applying for finance. And candidly, they're questions that you, as a future business owner, will need to know for maximum profitability. For more information about this and other dental-related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. And thank you from that word from our sponsors. We appreciate our sponsors of the Dental Guys. Well, this week, we're glad that we have been joined from a long time, right, guest of the show. Let's bring on Chris Mahan of Mahan & Associates to talk about all the stuff that you should be thinking about right now. Chris, welcome to the show. 
<laughs> hey guys, how are y'all doing this evening? Doing great. Awesome. Y'all hey, ready to save on some taxes? Year, right? Yeah, let's talk some taxes, man. I mean, yeah, I mean, are you are you as busy as you've ever been with this stuff? Like, is it getting is it always getting more complicated or what? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you couple that with you know the PPP rounds one and two, getting forgiveness. Now we're coming up. You know, a lot of people we want to off their balance sheet by year end, so they want round two forgiven. And we know most people have until around March to get round two, but they just want it gone. And again, I get it. So we're working on the PPPs and then you have the uh, provider relief funds or the HHS stimulus with that magical money that just dropped in everybody's accounts. You know, they're like, oh, wow. Um, rounds one, they just opened up round four. So I had a lot of clients reaching out and seeing if round if they should apply. And, you know, so again, they had another round of funding. They still have $56 billion to, in the war <laughs> chest to disperse with the magical direct deposits. So, uh, so it's fun so, stuff, yeah. but then that, and that so attestation was never... due on September 30. Oh, right. Right. And extended it for 60 days. So now we have until the end of this month. So let's just kind of start maybe with the, the basics. Okay. Because I want to talk about what's the newest stuff, right? But let's just talk about the basics. What What's changing that we know about or, or have confidence about this next year that would change the way that you would plan at the end of this year? Is there anything new? You know, there's all this discussion of this bill that's been wake, making its way through Congress, new tax, is it going to be a tax bracket change? Is it going to be the way businesses are taxed is going to change? Is capital gains, you know, what are some things, what are you hearing about those things and, and what do we need to be thinking about differently in a dental practice? Well, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on capital gains and, and that, that in that that tax going up especially on the affluent right you know again if you make over the magical number right now is over four hundred thousand, i think but uh but you know in capital gain so i know a lot of people are looking at you know gain harvesting and paying the taxes this year while it's at a lower bracket and kept bringing that money back in there was ridiculous thought of uh of taxing high income taxpayers on their unrealized capital gains which is about well, the the silliest thing I've ever heard. Cause does that mean if the market crashes like Oh seven or Oh eight or 2001, when the market crashes or cracks is a better terminology. Um, are they just going to, as IRS going to issue millions and billions and billions of dollars of refunds due to those losses, which you know, right. they're not going to do that. Um, but that being said, uh, so they capital gains are two areas. They say if you make over four hundred thousand dollars, you know, you are under four hundred thousand, you won't feel any difference. That I think that's to mathematically impossible with what they're trying to quote unquote pay for um, with some of the stimulus that they have proposed, uh, additional stimulus or um, infrastructure, human infrastructure um, mm. bills. Regardless, you know, again, they're saying it's paid for. I've always kind of find it ironic you can say it's paid for, but we have a was a you know fifty trillion dollar credit card that's not paid for, so I don't know how that math works out. Um, but they're also with the capital gains, they're increased the the brackets. Um, looking going back to like the Clinton era, we're right at forty percent, right? Um, they're talking about reinstating salt because I mean state and local taxes. Um, so if you're in uh, a highly taxed area, whether it's typically the West Coast or the East Coast, kind of kind of thing. Um, that can be very beneficial for, for, for taxpayers there. Um, but the, the one thing that I found is even when they pass major legislation increasing uh, taxes, there's all, that just opens up the, the doors to more opportunities. There's more opportunities that if you play the game right, you know, taxes, you know, they say is, you know, it's not only an important thing, it's the most important thing. If you play the tax code and play the game as they've given and written out in a <laughs> thousands of pages, right? And they tell us how to play the game, then you can save materially, materially more money with your tax planning than you can do with any other venture you do in your life. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I just, I just got off with a virtual meeting with a client that had a pro projected $350,000 tax bill. And we implemented a tax treatment plan and got it down to $72,000 just by changing the way they do of some things. Um, 
and again, that's not pie in the sky. That is that that's an honest to God meeting that I just literally got off the phone with before hopping on this call with you guys. So there's huge opportunities. And if people aren't getting tax projections to know where their tax liability currently falls, because I've never been fired for telling a client that they're going to owe a million dollars if they don't change what they're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. But I have been fired for a client owing $20,000 and didn't see it coming. Right. All too often, you know, I think a lot of ta some tax preparers, you have tax strategists and advisors and you have tax preparers. Um, I don't think mm. how anybody can afford not to have a tax strategist versus a preparer. If you get what you pay for and, you know, sometimes they'll say, man, how many times have you talked to your friends going, my tax advisor never brings ideas. I always bring them ideas and they shoot it down. My tax advisor says, oh, you had a great year. Here's your tax bill. That's not an advocate for you with the most lucrative leverage you have with your finances is your tax place and how you stack mm -hmm. it and how you do it and how you operate. Yeah. It's proactive versus reactive. It really is. Absolutely. And um, yep. I think, I think I love the treatment planning, right. That you're doing mm -hmm. for people at the end of the year. Right. As you like mm -hmm. to say, like the tax treatment planning session um, is, is glorious, right? Because here's your projection Here's the things that we need to do and, and you get to kind of pick how much, you know, how much you want to play the tax code. Like you say, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's there for us to use. And so you hire experts to do it. This is beyond just uh, grandpa, right? Doing your taxes, right? Uh, as business owners, you get to a point now where it's beyond a friend, right? Please don't hire a friend to do your taxes, um, I just don't recommend that. Do you, John? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's clearly something that, especially having familiarity in my opinion with our business, you know, mm. and, and knowing dentistry is something that I think I, I didn't understand or appreciate early on in my career is I don't think a lot of us do, you know, yeah. if you're not, if you're not living in that world until you have some education. Um, so with, so with that in mind, you know, so you're, you're talking about, these tax treatment plans. And we realize that, Hey, this is the podcast the stuff we're talking about here is you can't apply to your own situation without consulting somebody who's professional, obviously, right? We're, we're not, we're not giving out advice here. Hey, you should do this. You should do this. But you know, when you talk about next year, you mentioned capital gains being, you know, an important thing everybody's got on their mind. And, you know, let's talk about, you know, one of the things Wes mentioned at the beginning, you know, a lot of times we have uh, at the end of the year, you get some bad news hmm. about your tax bill and you're like, oh, well, let's buy some stuff, you know, hmm. so that we can reduce our taxes. And, you know, Chris, what's the problem with that What this year? What, what are you seeing that's different uh, that we should be thinking about uh, now versus, you know, maybe the last few years? Yes, yeah, the supply chain, right? The supply chain's got it where you can't get equipment delivered on time. You know, the name of the game is the equipment has to be paid for via, you know, cash or a loan instrument, right? Paid for, and it has to be on site and available for use, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't get it on site right now. I mean, I, I ordered six delivery units and, and six chairs three months ago, and now they're saying it's going to be mid-22 before they get in. And, and we thought we were being proactive seeing the supply chain. Good luck, you know? So those things are hard to get, and, and it varies based on the type of equipment you're looking for. I think you can get scanners, you know, you, you can get, you know, you get extra, you know, some of those things, but there's other things that, good luck. So it's not as easy as it has been historically, John, where, uh, you know, meeting with clients on November 8th going, hey, go buy a 3D printer, and, and it comes. But, the, you know, with those 3D printers and some of those items can be readily accessible, but you might have to look around and say, my your number one priority now is not necessarily only about cost it's if you can get it by them mm -hmm. and have them guarantee it on that list if you're going with digital workflow and the 3d printers and the scanners and all that stuff yeah yeah so talking about this impact that we're seeing just because a lot of us maybe coming into this podcast still not maybe having clarity on how 
the stimulus amounts that we've been talking about over the last couple of years are affecting our tax bill. Um, just kind of may sound simplistic, but it's really not. How is PPP forgiveness factoring into taxes? And how are these other stimulus payments factoring into taxes, income, things like that with our businesses? Absolutely. Uh, the PPP um, is 100% non-taxable. It was, it's literally free money, okay? Um, with the provider relief funds, the HHS, um, of course, you have to attest that you utilize it for the right reasons and you, ha you had the qualifying criteria to receive the money in the first place. Um, but then once that attestation is met, you get to keep it, but it's, we've picked it up as other income. So if you got a hundred grand from health and human services, it just dropped in your bank account. And you're like, Whoa. And the funny thing is I've had clients come and say, I got another one. I don't, where did this one come from? Right. Kind of thing. Um, but that money is a taxable event. So, so we're picking that up as other income on our, on our P and L's. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then um, they had the idle, idle loans. Right. But again, yeah. those are, oh, those are loans that I've, to, you know, I had most clients, you know, send the money back in because, you know, SBA started sending out the, you know, the monthly payment notices, et cetera. So, you know, you don't want to, in my personal opinion, you know, necessarily have to be tied to SBA, especially in those type of loan products. SBA has some really good vehicles and some really good stuff out there. So I'm not slamming SBA, um, but like with those idols, so those PPPs, if those things are outstanding, you can't transition your practice. And if you look at some of the, the fine language in there, it talks about compensation and bonuses to staff. I mean, it has a lot of, of stuff that you necessarily don't want to be handcuffed with in terms of having that type of binding liability, in my opinion. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I think some of the, when you start to talk about tax treatment planning, um, some of the old standbys that we have talked about over the years still are going to apply, but there's always discussion about at the end of the year, depending on where you think you're going to be, whether you should hold off on, on spending or you should spend more, right? That's a common question we get. And I'm not talking about equipment necessarily, but talking about things like supplies or, you know, should, or, or, or how we deal with that. Is that something that is different with this new tax bill at all? Do you feel like, or is it really kind of the same approach that we've taken over the last few years of, I know a lot of tax strategists and I like that. I like that terminology. They advocate for the idea of saying, you know, let's typically kind of front load our expenses for the end of the year, because we have a known right now. You know, we kind of know mm -hmm. what the tax treatment is going to be this year versus next year. We sometimes have an unknown. What do you mm -hmm. think about that approach versus, you know, delaying that into the next year and, 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 you know, keeping that cash quote unquote in your bank account. Is that a wise move? Well, that's a, that's a great question. My, my, my first tax professor always said that, you know, you play the tax game primarily for the current year with subsequent years in mind, of course. You know, again, if there was some looming major, I mean, you know, crazy across the board tax ch code changes, you know, material, then that may change my strategy a little bit that we'd like to to incorporate. But uh, no, I still think that if, if we have income tax problems, we need to fight for today. Because you know, again, as you mentioned earlier, John, nobody knows what tomorrow holds. Nobody knows what 2022 looks like in the wake of 2020. In 2021, right. I'm like, hey man, we might we're gonna fight for today. I don't want to pay taxes in April, right? We're gonna save that money, and we're gonna accelerate our expenses. And 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 there's two accelerating expenses and 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 decelerating income. A lot of practices closed down their collections department in the set last couple weeks of the year. Now, you know, with elect, electronic claims remittance, that's not gonna it's not near as effective as it used to be. I mean, you guys can remember when you come in on. You know, the bank accounts were at $5 and you came in on January 3rd and opened up, you know, the, the drawer with all those checks and whew, you had a, you know, $40,000 deposit day or something, you know, um, now it's not as effective on the, on the income, uh, deceleration, but you know, prepay. So I tell my clients, if we have tax liability, I always try to target the 25% tax bracket below. If we can keep you below 25% effective tax bracket, 
we're going to take that all day and high five, regardless if we're paying in a hundred grand and hundred grand or you know five, right? If I can get that twenty five percent sweet spot or below, I feel like we've done a, jo- a job well done. Um, yeah. So I'm going to come so, in and I'm, I'll accelerate those expenses, labs. You know, I mean, not labs, yeah. clinical supplies, order for January, or February. I don't want you going to Costco until March, right? You can front load rent for a year. You can pay 12 months of your rent. So if you got a tax problem, and the only time I shift that, John, is, for example, in Wes's circumstance, right? He's got a building with equipment that he's outfitting with for 2022. So guess what? We're going to do the same play with that piece of it. But next year, I will reverse it because he has plenty of other deductions that then we can just hold that in our back pocket until 2023. Yep. Yep, that makes sense. So let's talk about some of this more complicated stuff. So this research and development situation. I knew it was hearing kind of a little up. bit about it. <laughs> I've been hearing a little bit about it. It's there's been some news. I some just newsletters, heard about it. There's been some emails. It's been some discussion. Now, it kind of sounds like the uh, the old what was it manufacturing? What was D-pad. that thing that was like? Yes. Domestic production activities deduction. Right. I mean, I, I produce all kinds of domestic products yep. myself. We do personally. Well. Crowns, <laughs> and so did Wes. Implants. Yeah. Braces. I produce retainers. I produce retainers, lots of things. Linda yeah. Bars. All kinds of <laughs> night guards. We did whatever. a lot of Seattle protocol back in 2018. <laughs> yeah. So we literally got millions of dollars back for clients on the D-pad. That was one of our claims yeah. to fame. Yeah. So it went away, the D pad thing, but this research and development credit, I know it's not the same idea, but is it anywhere similar? Should we be looking at this? What, what is it? The research and development credit has been around for decades, right? The Internal Revenue Service incentivized companies like Google and Dell, you know, to, to, to give them tax relief to expand new technologies, new service and product lines. And so it's a very lucrative credit that you can apply um, and it's a dollar per dollar refundable credit, right? So again, it, it's a very it's a very nice thing. Until recently, um, it hasn't had a whole lot, a lot of application in dental, but I think you probably might've seen at study clubs or at seminars, you know, you're starting to hear some word on the street about people talking about the R&D credit or the research and development credit. And I think there's been some pretty, uh, in my opinion, sophisticated, uh, analysis from people that specialize in these credits um you know again they're there save your company up to three hundred thousand dollars but you know you can you can what it does is there's typically four tests that you have to meet and then you have subtests to that and if you can provide prove that you are either developing a new service line in your practice um or developing a uh or materially improving a, a current service line in your practice, uh, I think you have a, 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 high, a high potential of qualifying for this. And that goes for most practices that are and have been over the years investing in the new technology that's out there, whether it's going paperless, whether it's digital, whether it's a digital workflow, whether it's, you know, again, the 3D printers and are they, you know, are they milling their own their own crowns? Are they milling their own you know arches? Are they using three D scanners? What are they doing with the scanners? Has it del- improved the process? Um, dentistry has changed. You know, again, you get that's one of the things that I think has brought you two to such popularity is that y'all been cutting edge in exploring how dentistry and the delivery thereof has changed about how you can. Ab- treat sleep apnea as a preferred treatment, you know, pathway over a CPAP machine, right? Is it a dental office, right? I mean, that's one thing, um, you know, with the digital workflow with so many practitioners that started bringing in clear aligners into their service mix with practitioners that brought in, you know, doing implants and then, you know, uh, fixed dentures or, or fixed bridges into that game. That's a whole nother line. And so there are companies out there that will do an analysis for you and let you see what is potential there for you. Yeah, this is a, this is this is interesting to me because one of the things that kind of intrigues me about this, John, is that apart from our medical colleagues who practice in maybe a more um, uh, where they have. Um, best practices that are not saying that dentists don't have best practices in place, but we've talked about this, about 
you know, dentistry and, and who's regulating it. And, and, and basically your morals and ethics are pretty much regulating you in our field and what you mm-hmm. use on a day to day basis. You get a pick, you get to choose, you get to be the guy that makes the day in day out, you know, decisions in how you help patients get better. And that is, that's a medical practice. That's a dental practice. And, um, that's one of the, the, the beauties of dentistry is that we get to practice. And so I think this is something that intrigues me. I don't think it's far fetched. I think that, you know, what Chris, um, I've, I've heard about this is that it's something that goes through a very strict vetting process where you hire people that are really ex- experts at this, Chris, talk a little bit about maybe how this actually, I mean, you mentioned just a little bit there. It doesn't just happen by your accountant. You know, this happens to be something that, you know, you have to employ someone. Tell us a little bit about maybe how that works or. Absolutely. And again, you know, these are my thoughts and opinions and, and, and as to how you can take advantage of the tax code, because the Internal Revenue Service enforces the code, but they don't write the code. Congress writes the code. These credits are there for a reason. And if you pass the test um, and qualify, then you should definitely take advantage of that. That's what it's there for. Um, I have a competitor out of Dallas that just sent out a blog about it last week, about the R&D credits and how they're the IRS dirty dozen. And down at the bottom, they said, you might get fifteen to $30,000, and it's really going to be probably periodontists and prosthodontists that, that probably qualify for this. Well, that's not been my experience at all, right? The same competitor was wrong on everything on PPP, whenever that came out, if you go back to the original archive, right? So I'm like, <laughs> listen, to, listen to him and pay too much if you Shots want to go that fired. route. But, you know, whatever, Shots right? fired. We were a part of that I podcast love. whenever that happened, right, John? Do you remember yeah. that? Like, oh, what absolutely. in the yeah, world? Yeah, it was a moving target, and the target moved in the mayhem direction, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But uh, no, that, that being said... Um, Back to your, you want to make sure you're qualified with a very reputable company that does these, do these. That, mm. you know, at our firm, I'm not doing them internally for my clients. I'm proposing the idea to my client. I want our clients to see, go through the vetting process to see if it qualifies for them and what the opportunity, and it's ultimately their decision. But the company that we, we're utilizing and partnering with, so to speak, um, they've got dentists on staff, attorneys mm. on staff, enrolled agents, CPAs, And they also give you audit protection. So in the case that you're audited and the IRS challenges your R&D credit that they provided, they're going to come in and defend that on your behalf. Now, it's not a guaranteed win. There's nothing in life that comes without risk, right? But uh, so, I mean, again, you want to make sure you're partnered up with the right team. Like we were saying earlier, you don't want, you know, tax preparers. You want tax strategists, right? And you yep. want people to bring these ideas to you and it's your flavor, you know, if you want to do it or not. You know, we've had some other, you know, strong, you know, uh, opportunities that have been proposed to our clients. And sometimes clients will, yeah, let's do it. And they'll say, no, I'm going to pass on that. And it's to each client's discretion. But I think this R&D credit is powerful. And the ones that I've seen, I mean, again, I had a client amend three years, 17, 18 and 19 tax returns with the R&D credit and got $125,000 back. Right. That's some material, some material change. And I took the analysis and I tried to tear it down. And then I gave it to a pit bull CPA at our firm on our tax team. And sometimes, and this guy's Mr. Compliance. He's the one that we're always having to you know, walk off the cliff and be like, come on, man. You know, we're going to take this automobile deduction. Come on, you know, John. You know, but that being said, um, not you, John Rogers, but this guy's name. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> But, but, but that, that being said, and he, and he, and he had worked with R and D credits in the past as well. And he said, man, it looks like it looks perfectly fine. And so when he said it was cool, I excelled and said, okay, to the point, to the point of this, John and Justin, I'm going to look at doing R and D credit for my firm. Mm. So there you go. I'll put my money well, where my mouth is. Yeah. So that's yeah. something to me that's worth looking at. And I think that that, you know, that idea of those types of things are, are, you know, make sure you're checking the boxes, make sure mm-hmm. you're, you are talking to people that know what the boxes are and how to check them. Because obviously, you know, if you get questioned, you want to be able to, um, you know, to, to, to have somebody that advocates for you 
that did it right from the beginning. Um, do you think, you know, and I think that this is a good maybe way to sort of segue toward closing out the, the topics on taxes, but um, there's been discussion about the, the way that IRS is kind of going, that, that things are, you know, you're able to have more flexibility to do things and the IRS isn't really paying attention as much to things. Do you really think that's true? Or, or uh, you know, is that, is that, does that change with administration to administration? How stringent they are, how much enforcement they're doing? I mean, is that, is, does that even matter? I mean, obviously if you're following, like you say, the playbook that they've written and you're doing it by that playbook and doing it right, I guess you don't really think about it that way, right? You just you just have to do things, you know, you you just have to understand the playbook is what it seems like to me. But tell me if I'm wrong. No, absolutely. Absolutely. In general, I think you're you're correct. Now, I, I do think administrations and 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 power at times can influence all of our government entities, internal revenue service, notwithstanding. Um, they can come in and they can pick what they don't like and they can ask them to enforce certain things and to not enforce certain things. Just like our Department of Justice can decide what laws they want to enforce and what laws they don't. Just like our local districts and attorneys can judge, you know, determine who they charge and what they charge and what they don't. So mm -hmm. the IRS does have a little bit of that, but the biggest problem with the Internal Revenue Service is just be understaffed. They have been so backlogged for years now and some may say underfunded or not you not utilize the funding you know appropriately uh, but that being said they're fixing to have a major recapitalization there and they're talking about hiring a boatload like eighty thousand additional revenue agents to pay for a lot of this this new infrastructure whether it's traditional or or human infrastructure bills that you know are ones pending, you know, going to the president's desk at this moment and one still getting worked out. Um, they've got a material portion of how that funding is going to be realized by capturing current tax dollars that the IRS is leaving on the table. That tells me that they're fixing to pin their ears back and come back. So back to your point, John, I know it's a long winded answer. Um, I'm always, I mean, I welcome audits for my clients because we make sure, I mean, you guys know, I'm, I ask you for every, statement and last year's statement and that's what we do to protect you know to help you and serve y'all um but that being said is we we're stepping it up stepping it up our level of of documentation in the tax code documentation is everything so we're stepping it up on our behalf of our clients because i feel like the irs is fixing to get a couple st shots of steroids and they're gonna have their ears pinned back ready to go you know uh b before we uh kind of segue into part two of the show I wonder, um, Chris, how many people out there right now that are owners, right, um, aren't employing, like, do you have, like, you know, some stats on owner dentists who aren't employing a tax strategist? Yeah, hey, uh, easily. I'd say 80%. Eight? Wait a like, minute now. Eight out whoa. of ten aren't yeah I, that, that would be my initial whoa that's way higher than okay. i thought it would be yeah that's unbelievable because, that... because they're they're using their roommate from college their frat brother does their taxes and doesn't know the first thing about dentistry and they just check the box and go drink some beers at buffalo wild wings right oh, they, or word. or they just use the person that the prior the, their, their predecessor their legacy doctor used um and they never have that sit down and say Hey, what type of entity structure do you want to be and why? What are your long-term goals? How do you want to make this work? And again, tax planning is not done typically in November. You know, tax planning is done throughout the year saying this is how you should run this yeah. through your business. This is how you can take expenses and pay them with pre-tax dollars versus, it's, that's the name of the game, pre-tax dollars versus after-tax dollars, right? Yep. Yeah, so... You know, the thing is, you know, we don't we don't have uh, Justin Goodbread from Heritage Investors on here, but years ago, I was instructed, and and you know, I mean, Chris Mahan is uh, and his firm handle my things right now. It took John years to wrangle me in to no, not really, but it did take a while. I mean, and I had a good accountant before, just wasn't as proactive maybe as I wanted him to be, 
And one of the things that I think that was given to me years ago uh, when I opened my practice was just, hey, surround yourself with some people, right, that are made to do this and you're going to be more successful. And I think that's the goal here, right, Chris? You want everybody to be successful. Absolutely. It is a personal mission of mine to help people hold more of their hard-earned, hard-worked-for money in their checking accounts in any way that I can, whether that be overhead management, tax, strategic tax savings, retirement planning, the whole nine yards, and they're all intertwined. You can't just have one, right? You need to Mm -hmm. really, like you said, surround yourself with the right network and the right system and the right approach because it will make seven figure differences by the time people get to retirement age. Wow. This is awesome. John, um, as we're kind of closing out the show here, um, you know, I think about uh, what we're going to be talking about in part two. Tell us a little bit about that. And uh, Chris, thank you so much for coming on and talking about uh, tax preparation and planning and strategy, right? This R&D stuff, right? Like, dude, I'm ready, you know? So hey, yeah, so that's hey, cool, hey, John. Hey, 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 can, I, can, I, can I speak real fast to that again, too? Yeah. The, these guys, the, the, these teams, again, the ones that I've worked with and, I, and, and I've think are legitimate um this is not fly by night you know here's the calculation i mean Mm -hmm. there's correspondence with you with their dentist on staff they know i mean they're not just i mean you gotta see these reports i mean this isn't some two-sheeter right i mean they've gone through the gauntlet and it's very impressive and so that's the kind that if you're going to employ some of these tax strategies that are on the ir like i said that are on the irs's dirty dozen right because the dirty dozen aren't strategies that are illegal they're strategies that they feel like are taken advantage of right? right and so that being said this is a legitimate document and and yeah it's something to consider yeah, yeah. well then we're going to be talking about in part two is some of the things that you can do in your practice not only to just think about from a tax standpoint but how do you increase revenue in the coming year what are some of the things we need to be thinking about as far as uh, setting goals for the coming year? Uh, what about the hiring atmosphere and how does that affect what we do? What about costs and controlling those things? Those are some of the things we're gonna cover in part two. So um, this is, a, again, timely for a lot of you who are trying to decide about what 2022 is gonna look like in your own practice. So stay tuned. And while we're kind of signing off this show, thanks again for tuning in to The Dental Guys Make sure that you are checking us out on all the socials. We're all on, we're on all of them. Let us know what you thought about this episode, what you want to hear more uh, from us about, and uh, let us uh, give us some feedback. And definitely, definitely, if you haven't, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That helps us tremendously to be able to get our message out and let people know that we are the authority for dental-related, both CE as well as bringing on some of the best guests that we can get on the podcast circuit in the dental world. So thanks again for listening. And for Chris, for Wes, I'm John, and we are the Dental Guys.